So welcome everybody to our presentation today on witnesses work on AI, mis and disinformation and deepfakes. I'm Jesse Roth. I'm the manager of institutional giving at Witness. And I'm just going to give you a couple of quick tech uh, notes before we begin. So the first thing is to note that we are recording the session, as you can see um, at the top of your screen. Uh, there's a chat function everybody can use to please submit any questions that you might have throughout the presentation. Um, we'll be using the chat to drop in links to resources that Sam references throughout. So Sam is going to be speaking for about 40 minutes and then we're going to do a Q&A at the end. So feel free to drop in any questions that you have throughout and we'll, we'll circle back to those. Um, if you have any technical issues or anything, feel free to reach out uh, privately. You can message the hosts. And I think that's it. So thank you to the Skoll Foundation. This is, again, uh, a Skoll Foundation ecosystem event. We're really excited to be part of this. And um, yeah, just to kick us off, I think if people would like to put in the chat, um, we'd love to learn a little bit about who's joining us today. So you can write your name, uh, where you're joining us from, and what brings you here today. So what your interest in this topic might be. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sam Gregory, who's the program manager of Witness, who's going to uh, take us through our presentation. Thanks, Jesse. Um, it's uh, good to, to be online with you all. I hope everyone is taking care of themselves in this time. Um, we're going to um, take an opportunity here to share uh, some insights into understanding new ways people are creating mis and disinformation, um, how they relate to the current COVID-19 crisis and how we prepare better uh, for future waves of mis and disinformation. We're going to build on an extensive strand of a witnesses work in this area. Uh, I'm pointing to two links on the screen uh, that you can see right there um, that provide both a brief background or if you wanted to share on information to others who are interested in this and then an in-depth reading page. Uh, what we're going to cover in this presentation and we'll leave um, uh, plenty of time for, for questions and discussion uh, both in the chat as we go along and, and as we proceed is um, first just to highlight why Witness is working on this and for those who don't know our work to, to explain a little bit about that. Uh, then to talk about COVID-19 and the current context of visual misinformation and disinformation uh, that many of us are encountering. Uh, and then really help people understand what are deep fakes, um, these technologies that enable people to make more realistic representations of people saying or doing things they never did. Um, and then how should we respond? I think it's really important to emphasize the options we have to prepare better uh, for these new forms of mis and disinformation. So um, let me just introduce Witness. Um, we are a global human rights network. Uh, we've worked for almost 30 years helping people use video and technology to protect and defend human rights. Um, and the central question for us, and it relates to our work with journalists and grassroots human rights defenders and lawyers globally, some of whose uh, faces I've put up here and shared, uh, is how do we really um, make sure we protect the value of what technology has enabled people to do in terms of sharing more trustworthy accounts of their community struggles, of injustice, of media that has been obscured uh, for decades by government action or the inaction of the mainstream media. And how do we do that in a climate where they use tools that are commercial, that are uh, not built for them, uh, where there is a increasing drumbeat to assume that anything is inauthentic or misinformation, when the reality is for the people we work with, uh, many of them are taking the opportunity for the first time in their community's history to, to push for change around issues they care about. Um, and that work, uh, our work structure is based on four stages. Um, uh, how do we listen and anticipate from the communities we work with on five continents, including uh, where I'm based in the US? Um, how do we then collaborate with those communities to use video and technology as optimally as possible to defend human rights and promote civic journalism? Um, and then how do we share those experiences between communities that have similar needs, not best practices, but good practices, good workflows, the key tools? Um, and then how do we also focus on the tech infrastructure that makes it easier or harder for people to do this? Um, so. Our work in terms of human rights issues is broad. Uh, we do extensive work on war crimes issues, collaborating with communities who are trying to document those under incredibly adverse circumstances. Uh, we work uh, with communities documenting land rights issues, often ongoing, often off the radar for the mainstream media or their communities. Um, and we work with people documenting state violence, for example, here in the uh, favelas of Rio de Janeiro. Um, and I should note that 
um, obviously the discussion right now in the human rights community is about how all these types of issues are being exacerbated uh, by the current situation. So my colleague Adebayo, our manager for Africa, just shared a compilation of videos of extreme violence being used uh, to enforce lockdowns, for example, in uh, Mombasa in Kenya, and I encourage you to look at that. Um, and then we share that knowledge to similar communities. So we've been one of the key players along others in developing a field of work around citizen media as evidence um, in legal cases. Um, we work here in the US to help people distinguish fact from rumor around the raids of immigration authorities. Um, and this is just uh, sharing just a, a draft of some of the work we're now doing to highlight key skills that people need, key needs for communities. Um, as they document what's happening with COVID-19 and as the mainstream media isn't allowed in the streets, as lockdowns give impunity to governments. Um, and certainly many of our resources are used in these contexts to help people document and share um, compelling evidence and narratives. Um, similarly, here's another uh, piece of work we're working on that really captures some of the best practices that are emerging from people. Um, and I wanna talk now and move into the discussion around mis and disinformation about our work at a systems level. We believe very strongly that uh, you can't just support the capacity of human rights defenders and lawyers and journalists to document and share better if you don't also confront the reality that they do that within these commercial platforms that are largely unaccountable to them uh, and very distant. And you can't, you can support people with the right skills and tools, but if you don't support them uh, to push for change at a platform and regulatory level, uh, then you're handicapping their ability to be effective. Uh, and we work at multiple levels on this, uh, but one key area we work on is misinformation and disinformation, and particularly new and emerging threats like deep fakes. And we work at both ends of the spectrum. How do you prepare communities and how do you advocate at the systemic level? I'm gonna talk about the solutions we're seeing in both those spaces. Um, so let me talk about the COVID-19 context um, first um, and what uh, we've been seeing, but also what key allies and groups we look to in this space are, are really documenting extensively. So I'm going to point to a number of organizations who've really had a laser sharp focus on dealing with mis and disinf from what they're pointing to. Uh, and it's echoed in the experience of my colleagues working in Latin America and Africa, in South and Southeast Asia, in the US and in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, so the first organization and what they've been uh, describing and capturing is First Draft. Um, and these are six types of uh, coronavirus misinformation they've identified, uh, cutting across origins to uh, symptoms to spread uh, to the appropriate responses. Uh, they've just launched yesterday an online course that people might want to look at for journalists that you can access at the link uh, I've shared on the screen there. Um, and some of the examples I'm about to share come from First Draft's work, uh, and they're a close ally of witnesses. Um, I also want to point to what the um, International Fact Checking Network um, has been doing in this space. Uh, it's a global network of fact checkers who've, again, many of them been part of the work we've been doing around mis and disinfo, pointing types of content that are emerging around uh, COVID. Um, so, for example, uh, and I'll show some of these in a second, uh, you know, discussion about sort of sudden death, people falling down, uh, or false claims around testing and lockdown. Um, and finally, I want to point to the AFP's work. And again, uh, they've been part of a lot of our work over the last couple of years around um, verification and new forms of disinformation and misinformation, have a verification hub with many examples. Now, I'm going to share some examples of uh, COVID-19 misinformation. But what I want to highlight really clearly here is these really echo what we've seen over the last decade. These are the ways people deceive people with video and audio. Um, so, for example, on COVID-19, uh, you've seen a number of videos circulated claiming to show that, um, you know, very aggressive detention of people with um, symptoms or um, with a claim that they are infected. Uh, the two examples on the screen are um, from China. And in this case, they're what we might call a miscontextualized video. And we see this in all kinds of contexts globally around human rights issues, where someone takes one video and claims it's another. It's an incredibly easy way to, um, to deceive, sometimes done with deceptive ideas, sometimes shared, um, not really realizing that it's not what it is. Um, so these show people detained in a, um, um, a simulation, but are then shared as real. Um, similarly, this video claiming to show the Wuhan market is in fact from Indonesia. Uh, these videos claiming to show riots at a supermarket um, shared in um, the Netherlands and Germany um, and um, unpacked by many of the groups we just mentioned as well as Bellingcat um, are from previous events. They're not from now, but they're recycled into the current context. 
um, miscontextualized video. And as I mentioned, we've been documenting real video of uh, violence during lockdowns. We're also seeing miscontextualized video um, showing previous events. The two on the screen here are from Zimbabwe, um, claiming to show suppression of, a, um, of people violating a lockdown, in fact, from an earlier event. And then this is actually a notorious video from the Hong Kong suppression of protests, recycled the one in the bottom right. Um, another one here claiming to show coffins or people uh, queuing up to get death certificates, but are actually from different things. And this is by far the most common form of video misinformation that Witness has seen over a decade of working in this space. Um, manipulated video is less common. Um, we have in the US obviously examples to mind like the Nancy Pelosi video, um, uh, examples in Argentina and in Philippines of prominent women politician having their videos manipulated. Uh, this is one of Jack Ma uh, claimed to show him praising China's response actually splicing in audio from a different uh, source. Um, we very commonly see brand appropriation. This is a big concern for major media. Um, and staged video actually doesn't happen that much in the human rights space. It's not that common or necessary. Uh, there have been a couple of examples in the COVID um, situation that we've seen. This is actually a previous example from public health work documented by First Draft uh, of a staged video around anti-vaxxing um, in Pakistan. And so what I'm highlighting here is I think we need to place um, both our understanding of COVID-19 and also our understanding of deepfakes in this context of a decade of existing manipulation. Uh, that has happened, mainly miscontextualized videos, but also some edited videos, some staged videos, um, often increasingly integrated into a series of disinformation strategies that um, I won't have the time to document in detail here, but things like the fire hose of falsehood, where you pump out multiple contradictory accounts, or disinformation tactics like exploiting a data void, uh, which is when there is not information in a search term, um, or using bots. Um, or laundering genuine content, but reframing it in a way that makes people understand it in a different way. Um, so we're going to pop up a couple of polls um, in the, the chat box. Um, please take those polls. They're very simple ones. Um, how much do you know about deepfakes? How concerned about you them, them now? Um, and how concerned do you anticipate being um, in the next five years? Uh, just to get a sense of this, this group in terms of what you're thinking about this. Thank you. Great. And I think we see the results sort of settling in. And unless we have a late surge, I know this is a problem with polling. You can never quite tell if it's going to be right until the end. Um, so we've got, sounds like generally we've got a folks who know a little to somewhat about deepfakes. So I'm going to go into uh, some background on deepfakes now. Um, significant level of concern, which I think is justified. Um, and then a, a perception that increasingly we may have more concern about this. And, and I think this is actually the right, I want to just note that I think this is a position we're coming from as well. And I'll explain why we're coming from that position um, and then uh, and explain what we can be doing about this concern and how we should be responding across a range of sectors right now. So let me just contextualize what Witness has been doing in this space. Um, we organized the first expert meeting globally around this uh, just under two years ago that brought together experts across many disciplines to understand and to, to identify areas where they saw ways to prepare better for deepfakes. Um, and we spent the last two years really working to do threat modeling, uh, to talk to technology companies, to talk to major media. Uh, for example, we collaborated with the Partnership on AI and BBC on a major media meeting around this, and then to participate in some of the work around technology development. Um, and very importantly to witness, uh, we need to see this as a global discussion. And so a lot of what I'm gonna highlight today is what happens when we take the perspective of um, the global south, not center this on Silicon Valley or Washington DC or Brussels, but understand the needs and the prioritization coming out of the global south and out of marginalized communities in the US and the global north. Um, so we've just finished uh, three expert meetings that brought together key stakeholders, fact checkers, news, human rights defenders, leaders of movements in Brazil, in South Africa from Sub-Saharan Africa, and in Malaysia from Southeast Asia. And I think um, as we think about technology, there is a classic problem of how do we make sure we center the voices of people who are most likely to be harmed and who are least involved in the discussion about technology development right from the start. So let me move into explaining technologies to respond to the, the poll in terms of what people are learning and understand here. So what, what can you do with a deepfake? What are they? Um, 
So first thing to know about um, the, uh, the AI systems uh, we use to generate fake images is typically they rely on training data. So for example, to make a, face, a fake of my face, uh, you need to find what is called training data, which are images of my face that you can feed into a um, AI process, an artificial intelligence process, uh, in order to generate the fake. And much of the work um, that is happening around deep fakes um, and deep fakes perhaps is the simplest way to think about them are those face swaps that enable you to make it look like someone did or said um, something they never did, um, is that the, they are created by feeding this training data into a type of cat and mouse game between two what are called neural networks that compete with each other, one to create a forgery, the other to detect that forgery. And the reason we think of it as a cat and mouse is when the forgery detector detects a forgery, then the forgery maker uh, tries to improve. So it is a cat and mouse of improving the quality of forgery of a face or a voice or a person's body. Um, and I'm gonna make this resolutely non-technical by pointing there are many ways to do this with different types of architectures, some of which aren't exactly like what I've described, but the basic idea is you have this adversarial contest to create better fakes uh, using an increasing range of these um, what are known as deep learning networks. Um, and the most visible way people see these technologies deployed is in what we call these deep fakes. So um, a couple of my favorite ones. I'm asking you all to join me in providing support and guidance to our children so that we can make a real difference. Of course, Melania Trump as um, uh, President Putin, um, or this very current to me looking at what people are saying on Twitter. <laughs> Uh, which is, of course, the technology entrepreneur Elon Musk as a baby. Um, but what we want to expand for folks is to understand that this is really only one aspect of the manipulation. And as we've understood this by talking through threats with people, it's important to understand other ways that digital uh, image manipulation and audio manipulation happens. So uh, first, I want to show a very simple example. Uh, uh, just look at this and uh, if we were live, I would ask you to shout out how many policemen you see. You can type in how many policemen you see if that helps you. Um, but uh, in this one, typically people see three policemen. It's a very short video um, and you might spot one more behind the Jeep. This is in fact an example of a video that has had a police officer removed in it. Very simply by um, the team at the New York Times visual investigations team, they were able to remove an object in a video. And this is increasingly possible with new forms of media manipulation techniques. Uh, and this is commercially available. It's a tool called Content Aware Fill that you can access on Adobe Tools. Um, another thing you can do is change the weather in a scene. Uh, so this is a tool from NVIDIA AI from several years ago now uh, that enables you to make it easier um, to um, make it change the weather in a scene. In this case, um, you could take a guess. Do you think it's the one with the snow or the one without the snow that is real? Um, we would do a poll, we haven't created one, but uh, take a moment and think. Uh, well, if you guessed it was the one with the snow, you were right. That is the real one, the one without the snow um, has had it removed. Um, and this is a AI technique uh, designed around automated vehicles. Um, let's move to another one. The ability to create an image uh, of something that never existed, a realistic representation of a real object. So this person does not exist as a site that creates uh, faces of people who look realistic but never existed. So the person on the right is a realistic face of a human, but it is not a real human. And you can see from the progress in this chart how quickly this has improved. And the consequence of this is you can now de um, download you know, up to 100,000 faces generated by AI. These are all look like real people, but they're not. Um, another aspect of this is what we might think of as the ability to create uh, realistic representations of people saying things they never did. Uh, so look at these Obama videos. Uh, I'm gonna show a few more on this slide here. Um, I'm not playing the audio here. You're not missing something if you don't hear the audio. Um, so take a look at this. Which one is the fake one? Which one of these is not real? Is it top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right? Have a guess in your head. They're all fake. And what these are, these are ways in which people are manipulating the lips of an individual and the face of an individual uh, to match up with things. And the reason I'm highlighting this is perhaps the most sort of visible way in which these tools are being used at the moment um, 
is uh, sometimes to create fake audio of someone. So I can create a fake audio of my own voice using commercial tools. This is one called Liarbird that's now been bought by another company uh, that sound relatively realistic. I sound Canadian when you listen to my voice, but if you don't know me well, you might believe I'm Canadian. Um, and then this is the flip side of that. And I'm not gonna show this clip, but this uses a tool in which you can match someone's lips to an audio track. So here's a video in which David Beckham, you'll see in the top right, uh, speaks in Kenya Rwanda and then he speaks in Mandarin, and then he speaks in Spanish, and then he speaks in French. And it looks like it's him saying it, but what it is in fact is his lips being matched to an audio track. Um, and you know, this is a tool that is now commercially available uh, with certain parameters. And we just saw its use in an election in India where a BJP politician used it to speak in two languages he didn't speak to his electorate, raising really complex questions around what we should trust and not and what is ethical. Um, and further out, we're starting to see some ways these tools can be used in combination. So for example, you could edit a transcript of a video and the video would change in line with that. So the audio and the video talking head would change in line with your editing of a transcript. For example, in this one to make it, you know, as they use in this research paper to change the stock price of Apple. Um, and then finally, I want to point to one area that is um, emerging, which is around uh, real people as puppets, where you make it look like someone's body is moving in relation to um, um, a computer algorithm driving it. So I'm going to show you a clip and you'll see on the right uh, what looks like a real person. It's not. It's a representation of a real person and their movements, their dancing are being driven by the, 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 the movements of a dancer, a real dancer in the top left. <laughs> So let me recap a little bit what we're talking about here then. So these are the possibilities. These are what the technologies can do. Uh, alter photo just like with videos, uh, create a realistic voice or face for human that never existed, simulate and manipulate a representation of a real individual's voice, face, or movement. Um, and that's interplay with other AI-driven trends like micro-targeting, uh, effective computing, which responds to people's emotions, uh, and things like that. Um, now I'm gonna take a pause here because at this point, some of you might be saying, well, uh, what, where's a harmful deep fake? Those were all kind of fun. Like I like seeing people being made fun of in those ways. I thought that was kind of nice to be able to dance in a way that is better than I could in real life. Um, or where do I prioritize this right now? What are my problems with all the other fake news, not deep fakes? And I have a thousand problems in deep fakes, not one of them. And that probably feels very true right now as we look at um, our immediate responses to COVID-19, to the escalating human rights crisis, the need for true information. And this, I think, calls into um, to us to really think about how do we balance between preparing for things that will have scaled harms and dealing with current harms. And in Witness's work, we do both. And here we see a real opportunity to, to prepare better for, for deep fakes and to avert harms. And this is why we're engaged on this. And the reasons we're taking it seriously, we wanna share from our perspective, um, the technology is improving. It's getting easier to use, more adaptable, more lifelike and faster. Um, audio is getting better faster and audio gives you very few semantic clues, whether it's a real person, right? If you just hear a voice, you don't have the other visual clues. Um, and we're seeing combinations and it's also moving from being artisanal, right? Like, oh, that's an amazing piece of art to volume, right? People can do this with lots of videos at lots of scale. Um, the other things we're seeing is that um, lower technical skills are needed and the barriers to entry are falling. So it's moving to mobile, uh, you can get access to deep fakes as a service and it's being commercialized within consumer tools. So as an example there, um, I was in Myanmar a few weeks back and people instantly recognized deep fakes because there was one circulating of the chief minister of the city of Yangon, um, his face put into a K-pop band and we played it and everyone came into the room to come to the session because they saw this deep fake that had been circulating in Facebook Messenger or in WhatsApp and things like that. Um, and then the final thing to note here is the relationship to existing misinfo problems. It's our cognitive reception of video is very different from text and photos, right? We don't have the filters we have to look at something and assess it. We misremember things. And again, placing this in a disinformation context, actors are sophisticated in this space. They use things in smart ways. They deploy them in ways that um, relate to a range of tactics. Um, and we have to be thoughtful about where these plug into those threat models. 
so I want to move now to the, the section about how we respond um, and, and, and set us up to think about how this community and others can really uh, prepare better for this to avert potential harms. Um, first thing I want to state at a macro level is in one sense, there's a very good thing about this. People want to solve this. Uh, there are tech companies, there are entrepreneurs, there are startups. Um, but our observation as witnesses, they're not listening to the right people. You have to be listening to a broad, global, diverse set of stakeholders on this to avoid the harms we saw, for example, with misinformation and hate speech in Myanmar, or we're seeing around elections globally, or we're seeing with closed messaging platforms. So what's missing is the voice of a very diverse set of frontline defenders, of journalists, of media, of people working on democracy at a grassroots level and at a global level. So 10, 12 things we can do now. And don't worry, I'm not going to talk through 12. I'm going to just highlight a few um, so that we can then jump into the discussion and the questions. Um, you can read more about them again at the link that we shared earlier. Um, if you're interested in digging more and understanding the background to many of these recommendations. Um, uh, first one we want to highlight is the need to de-escalate the rhetoric and recognize this an evolution, not a rupture, and that our words create many of the harms we fear. Um, I say this because much of the rhetoric around deep fakes implies we're surrounded by them now. Uh, polling makes people think they're surrounded or leads us to understand, in fact, that people think they're surrounded by altered media, when yes, there is a lot, but much media is not substantively altered. And in fact, there are many people trying to share truthful information as well, to go back to what we've seen in witnesses experience. So we need to de-escalate the rhetoric. We need to keep calm. The sky is not yet falling. Um, but if we prepare, we can do better in dealing with it. The second thing we want to highlight, and I think this is really important, we frame this as a misinformation, disinformation conversation, but actually the real harms right now are in gender-based violence and cyberbullying with deepfakes. And those are real. They are right there happening to both ordinary women, to celebrities and journalists uh, globally. Um, one of the first stories that really paid attention to this was around Rana Ayub um, uh, talking about this in the context of uh, horrific attacks to her as an Indian journalist. Uh, prominent uh, in documenting rights violations in India. And then a report that came out from a group called Deep Trace highlighted um, that 96% of current deep fakes are pornographic or non-consensual uh, non intimate images. Um, fourth recommendation we have, and I think this is very much driven by our experience talking with, um, in the convenings we've done with uh, the BBC and the Partnership on AI, uh, with um, uh, in Brazil with key stakeholders there in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Southeast Asia is we need threat models and solutions from a global perspective uh, that are not fixated just on elections in the global north. It's really important to protect our senior leaders in elections in the US. It's as important to protect the Myanmar elections, to protect the integrity of news in South Africa, to protect civic defenders in Brazil. So our solutions need to reflect that. Um, so we've done threat prioritization globally. Here's some images of that happening um, in some of the work we've done. And some of the things people have highlighted are actually coming from the outside, not from the center. That in fact, this magnifies the threats already experienced by marginalized groups, right? We know gender-based violence was used and is used against prominent civic leaders. Uh, here, the example of Marielle Franco in Brazil, who was then assassinated. We see identity, fals identity falsification happening with many of the people Witness works with. And we also heard very clearly people saying, this is gonna compromise this hard won victory where for the last 10 years, at least we've been able to show what's wrong and show the reality in Northern Rakhine State in Burma, in Syria, in Yemen, in police violence in the US and in Brazil. It's not that we've developed proper systems of accountability and response, but at least we can show the evidence. And now people are saying, this is gonna attack this at every level, at a government level, at a uh, process level, when we try and bring it in front of judges. Uh, it's gonna reinforce the problems we already have with messaging apps. This comes up with all the existing uh, tools for misinformation sharing is when it gets shared in these sort of digital wildfire problems online. Um, and people note that this will overwhelm capacity. Most journalists don't know how to do media forensics. Certainly most human rights activists and investigators don't or lawyers. Um, and most pernicious, it reinforces this sort of plausible deniability, the ability of anyone to say, that's a deep fake, prove it's not. Um, and we've seen that from politicians in multiple countries already. So I wanna just recap, I think this is really important to highlight these perspectives that come from outside the center, from outside Silicon Valley. How do we center the most threatened leaders? How do we think about how this threatens video as evidence? How do we bolster the capacities of journalists and fact checkers? How does this further impact public trust? 
and how does this intersect with existing problems of digital wildfire, the way rumors spread very quickly, often in closed messaging apps. Um, so I want to just encourage you, like there's obviously a whole list of threats that could be concerned about, and I'm coming here from a human rights and journalistic perspective and a concern for the integrity of societies and our ability to share information. But we encourage you to add and we'll capture some of these what worries you about these technologies? That's a question um, we'd like you to respond to in the chat to the extent you feel comfortable. And then what threats do you worry about most in your context? Tell us to the extent you feel you can be granular and say very specifically this, I worry about how someone's gonna make it look like, um, you know, civic leaders in my community are drunk or, are, um, or it's gonna manipulate the voice of um, key political leaders and lead to, to ethnic risks, you know, something specific or something general. I would really like to hear this. Um, we will, I think there's a note in the chat about whether we're going to be broadcasting the chat side. We're not going to be sharing the chat side. We just want to clarify that we will share the video, but we're not sharing chat because obviously your names are in that. So I just want to clarify that this is not tying your names to this in the, in the shared video. Um, fifth recommendation we have here is to promote cross-disciplinary approaches. I highlighted earlier the incredible work that's been done by groups like First Draft, uh, Witness has worked in this space for a decade, groups like Bellingcat. How do we make sure that the existing expertise is valued highly here that comes from communities who are dealing with this globally? Um, and we've invested in this really connecting researchers and tools designers um, to the people who are building the tools to detect this. And I'm going to highlight one element that really comes through and we have a report you can see online if you look at uh, or if you Google this or drop it in the chat um, is that we really need to think about this in a continuum. And so I'm talking about deep fakes, but in almost every community we talk to um, in when we talk to people who deal with mis and disinformation, we have to look at existing shallow fakes, all these miscontextualized videos and many of the tools we need and the solutions we need cut across that continuum. So we need better ways to do reverse video search. So you can see if a video has been recycled. We need better data sharing across platforms and accessibility of tools to users. So one of my colleagues in Southeast Asia was saying, why can't I get access to the tools that help me distinguish between um, something that's already been identified as a rumor? Why is that only restricted to a small group of entities? Um, so we really need to think in this in a continuum between existing shallow fake problems and deep fake problems. I want to talk now about a solution that comes up a lot, which is like, can't we just teach people how to spot these? How do we think about media literacy? Um, and so one recommendation we have is to support research into how to better communicate invisible to the eye, video manipulation and simulation to the public. Um, and this is important research. Uh, uh, the Partnership on AI and First Draft have just launched a project on this that will be developing really good research on how we talk to people about manipulated media, um, particularly when it looks to the eye as if it's real and you're encountering a social media feed, not in a Hollywood or a Bollywood or a Nollywood film. Um, and, and it's funny, I often talk about deep fakes and I've had this sort of feedback given to me. It's uh, people say, well, it's easy to spot a deep fake, right? It's easy, right? They don't blink. And the reason people say this about a year ago, actually more than a year ago, a piece of research came out that showed that deep fakes didn't blink as often as you might expect. Uh, the problem with this is that the researcher who produced that research received a couple of weeks later, as you might expect, someone sent him a deep fake that blinked. And this is because of this adversarial nature of how these tools are being built, that you need to adapt the training data, you need to adjust your algorithms, and you can then create deep fakes that blink. And the underlying risk here is we shouldn't teach people to use the current weakness of the algorithm. It's kind of algorithmic heel, Achilles heel as a detection tip, it won't last. Um, instead, we need to help people really think about media literacy informed by technical signals. And what I wanna highlight here is I think there's a tremendous value in the work that's being done by people around media literacy online. I'm gonna to point to a couple of the ones that we use in our training work and that we're looking to adapt uh, with the communities we work with. The SHEEP acronym that's used by First Draft, uh, the SIFT acronym that looks at stop, investigate the source, find better coverage, trace claims that comes from Mike Caulfield, uh, a media literacy expert in the US. But what we also need to do is recognize that technology does have a part to play here. So we need to think what signals do you need to give people that enable them to exercise this, right? So what is the technical signal that says there's manipulation in this video, you might wanna sift, you might wanna go bah, let's use the SHEEP acronym. So how are we doing that? Technology can intersect with media literacy and probably has to when it comes to this invisible to the eye manipulation. So this takes me to the role of technology and platforms. And I wanna talk about that particularly because we're also seeing many things happening now 
in the COVID-19 context um, uh, that the platforms are doing. It's kind of been like an accelerant on existing trends. The platforms are doing so many things that many people were asking them to do before and some we weren't asking them to do. Um, so what is the responsibility we want from platforms around content moderation, around detection, and around authentication, i.e. proving what's real? So let me highlight a few things in this space. First, detection. There's a lot of work on how we detect deep fakes, and I'm not going to go into the technical details, uh, but to note that we document and survey on our website the different detection techniques. Um, some of them use the same techniques as are used to create a deep fake. They use these deep learning methods to identify deep fakes, um, the same adversarial process. Um, others use more kind of bespoke techniques. This is one that looks at the characteristic head movements of a world leader and how they move with particular words. So it's very bespoke, but helps see if uh, makes it harder for a deep fake to recreate that, that synchronization. And we're seeing real investment in this space. Actually, just two days ago, uh, a million dollar challenge launched by Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, and Punch when AI ended that was giving a million dollars in prize money for detection algorithms. Uh, and Witness has been part of a steering committee there with other civil society and major tech companies to try and make sure this uh, detection work really aligns with the needs globally, right? So how do we make sure that technology serves people uh, in a meaningful way, not just lip service? Um, and I wanna highlight some of the things we've been bringing into that space, because they really relate to how uh, it's no good having a detection tool if it doesn't actually meet global needs, particularly of vulnerable populations and um, non-mainstream media and journalists. So how do we make it available? How do we make it available in diverse platforms? Not just you have to download code, you, have, you can see it in WhatsApp, you can do it in Facebook. How does it make it relevant to real world scenarios like this gender-based violence we've seen? And how is it available to a wide range of frontline fact checkers? Not just the very esteemed media organizations like the BBC or CBC or the New York Times, but national level and local media who are the front lines of defending this. And how do you make sure it's explainable? It's no good just telling people that a deep fake has been detected, given people's justifiable skepticism about technology and what it tells us. So we have to be really nuanced about detection, and then we have to plug that into this media literacy I was describing, so we can help people understand this. Let me talk about content moderation. Again, um, there has been a lot of criticism and it comes out of the human rights sector. Uh, Witness has done a lot of work on content moderation and seeing how the platforms take down uh, critical human rights evidence and don't take down hate speech. Um, and we're in the middle of a grand experiment literally right now with COVID-19 because most of the platforms have moved to a greater degree of automation of their content moderation than we've expected in the past. Um, and so the question becomes, what do we want the platforms to do? Um, and I would highlight that we've seen in the last few months, uh, Facebook and Twitter, and to some extent YouTube releasing their new policies on this. And if you wanna see more detail of our critiques on it, you can go online and see uh, our feedback on the Facebook policy that we were closely involved in feeding back on and on the Twitter policy. Um, and I think what's notable about both of them, and we think they're both pretty strong policies, is they deal quite well with um, the idea of, um, you know, really focusing, for example, on deep fakes where people can't detect the manipulation, uh, on focusing on whether they're deceptively shared and created. Their Achilles heel, their weaknesses, is how well they'll apply across a global set of circumstances where communities do not trust the platforms are resourced, understand the context, are not subject to political pressure to make decisions that will just turn this into another either tool that um, takes down things that it shouldn't or is manipulated and misused in power. Um, and they also note, and with all these policies, as to what extent they deal with the broader shallow fake issues, the broader problems. Twitter does, Facebook does to a much lesser extent, at least to start with, although it is strong on how it deals with deep fakes. And we are in the middle of this grand experiment. So I've just put up on screen all the things the platforms are doing around COVID-19 mis- and disinformation. And it's critical, we as key stakeholders here, as civil society, as media, as, as funders and foundations, decide what we like and don't like about this. They're providing information. They're taking down much more content. They took down a world leader, Bolsonaro, um, Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela for sharing uh, potentially harmful information from their platform on both Twitter and Facebook. Uh, they have been um, prohibiting certain sales. The question we have to ask now is what do we want to be adapted further to deep fakes and shallow fakes more broadly? What do we want? Uh, what do we don't want? And I'm happy to talk more about that in the discussion. I think this is something we need to be really focused on over the next uh, weeks and months. Um, 
let me end with one final technical point and then we're going to start moving into the q a so we have plenty of time for that um, i mentioned before that one of the technical solutions around authentication of what is real so detecting what is false um, moderating what is false detecting what is real might be three ways to think about this um, and there are emerging trends in what we've been describing as authenticity infrastructure. So verified capture tools uh, that track when something was filmed or shot, uh, verified publishing tools that track when something was distributed or edited, and then an increasing focus, which we think is very important on reverse image search and similarity search, i.e. has something been shared before so that we can see if it's been miscontextualized. Um, and we've worked in this area. We were one of the first groups to build tools for building greater trust into images. Uh, with our partners, the Guardian Project, we built a tool called Proof Mode that is used by human rights evidence gatherers. But what is happening now is this is moving from niche to mainstream. And I think this is where it's critical that civil society and media be part of the conversation. Uh, this can't be a tech-led conversation that excludes those voices. And we've been glad to be part of um, the discussions around something called the Content Authenticity Initiative, which is an initiative that Adobe, Twitter, and the New York Times have launched to better look at this authenticity infrastructure discussion. Um, and I think the questions we need to put on the table, and again, I say this in the context of preparing better so that civil society and human rights and media are not disadvantaged when these things roll out globally over time we released the first report in this area it's called ticks or it didn't happen it just came out you can look at that online and in that we really raised the dilemmas we need to address to make sure this is rights protecting freedom of expression protecting privacy protecting at a global scale um, and this is not because we don't think tracking what is real is a bad thing Almost everyone we work with, someone who documents video as evidence, someone who documents police violence, wants to show a land rights struggle, wants to be trusted. That's the key underlying driver, wants to be seen and trusted, but they don't want to be disadvantaged in the race for trust by the infrastructure that's built around them. So today, this type of technology is opt-in. Tomorrow, it will be driven much more by governments and platforms and by public pressure. I'll just point to a couple of the questions we're raising in this space. Um, as you build this structure, this infrastructure of technology to prove what's true, um, whose voices could be accidentally or deliberately excluded or chilled? You know, who uses old technology? Who can't risk sharing extra data because it will compromise them or their community? Um, who has the burden of proof increased on them? Right, we know about the CSI effect where everyone expects now that you have some whiz with their forensic architecture. Um, we don't have that in most of our courtrooms, certainly outside um, rich countries and judges don't know how to do that journalists and human rights investigators don't know how to prove things how do we avoid setting the burden of proof too high uh, what if we end up giving people too simple signals right we say this is authentic but actually it's just a miscontextualized video or someone's broken the security because inherently all of these will have some security flaws and who could abuse these data and tools right there's a big discussion in the digital space right now about who's going to use the data we're sharing right now so who will abuse this uh, with data surveillance and with fake news laws like Singapore has passed saying they can decide what's true uh, or Tanzania and many other countries and in fact many countries are passing right now Cambodia Philippines Hungary um, and the final thing I want to say is we need to promote ethical standards right it's no good saying uh, we don't want these things from companies if politicians if civil society if campaigners use them and woefully few people have signed on to the pledges that exist not to use doctored images um, in the US, just Joe Biden on the presidential side, Elizabeth Warren previously made a statement on this. We have to have a better statement on this from our leaders. We have to press for that. So let me finalize by just re-going back to what um, people globally in the, the expert convenings we've convened told us needed to happen. We need to focus on media literacy, especially for the most vulnerable. We need to invest in that. We need detection tools for the range of manipulations, so shallow fakes, like those miscontextualized videos I showed, and enclosed networks like WhatsApp, as well as deep fakes. We need detection tools that are cheap, accessible, and explainable for more people. And we need to invest in the capacity of journalists and people who are fact checkers and truth finders to use these tools, otherwise what's the point? And platforms need to be part of this. They need to have better tools, better data access generally to show, particularly cross-platform and within platform, how false and falsified information moves. So um, we're gonna move into Q&A now um, and discussion. Thank you for your attention. I know it's hard watching a Zoom screen for this long. Um, and I'm sharing again um, the key links that will take you to Backgrounders. Uh, we'll post this up at the end again. Um, we have a survey that you can fill out. Well, of course, it's anonymous. We don't request an email in it um, about the threats you're seeing and you'd like to see us prioritize from your civil society media funder uh, expert position. Thank you.
Great, thank you, Sam. Um, okay, so for Q&A, we have a lot of questions that are streaming in. And I think we'll start with the one. We have a question from Maria who wants to know, when it comes to identifying threat models and finding global solutions, is there any institution or a multilateral that you propose should be taking the lead? Um, I don't think there's an existing institution that does this systemically towards the tech industry and towards government. Um, and uh, we haven't seen anyone looking to do this. I think there's a real need for investment in a range of mechanisms that do this. Um, it's a consistent problem that we see at Witness is, although the platforms talk to a greater range of civil society now, uh, they still don't talk to a wide range. They don't think in terms of a broad range of experts. So in our expert meetings, we've had experts who technically are experts. We've had experts via lived experience, like major movement leaders in the countries. We've had community-based activists. We've had journalists, we've had fact checkers. And I think thinking about that mechanism, I think it's a great question. I don't know of an obvious one, but if someone had a suggestion in the chat, we would love to hear it. Uh, because we, actually, we definitely see that need, though we also see the need for thinking of it in a diverse set that doesn't end up excluding um, nascent communities or emerging communities who should be part of particular tech um, problems or solutions or particular regulation. And I should say we've seen this in regulation as well. My colleague Dia Kiali has worked extensively on terrorist and violent extremist content regulation, which is a legitimate need of governments, but often ends up excluding um, particular voices that are critical voices. And that happens on the regulatory side as much as on the government side. Great. Um, another question that a couple of people have raised is, um, why can't the software solutions that create deep fakes be forced to tag videos or be required to have a caution warning like there might be for cigarettes or alcohol? And is there, if you can speak, I know you have already a little bit, but more on um, the movement on those sorts of solutions and what the challenges might be. Yeah, no, so this is a great, a great, a great discussion point. So I think I didn't cover it in one of our recommendations looks at what are the responsibilities of creators of tools to make deep fakes. Um, and some of the areas that have been highlighted there, and I'll point to the work of Aviva Vadia, who's been doing work in this area, and Jess Whittlestone, um, looks at questions like, um, can you have a requirement to mark a deep fake? Can you have traceability of deep fakes, i.e. retain an original? Um, can you have a requirement for consent when it's used in a commercial context? These are all ways of reducing harm. They don't reduce the risk of someone using it. Most of the code is open source. People can access this, state actors will. So those are steps that you could do at a technical level. And the other thing you could demand, and we've been putting this as a demand, is that companies building synthesis tools invest equally in detection tools and detection capacity. So we don't have this unequal arms race between creating fakes and detecting fakes at a financial and resource level. So I think those are important. Um, people will work around them, as I say, but having those there on the table is pretty critical. Um, we should be aware of unanticipated risks. Um, I didn't mention that one area we've also looked at is how people can use deep fakes actually in powerful ways for good, like to anonymize people's faces, but retain their expression you know, as we look about right to anonymity. And of course, if you retain the original of that and make that available um, in either a tool for authenticity and tracking edits, or a tool for using deep fakes to protect anonymity, um, you compromise that. So there are significant trade-offs, but I'd point to some of those points to, to start with. Yeah, somebody else actually had asked, can the deep fakes technology be used for good if there are applications that don't face much criticism? Yeah, so so there are certainly potential uses for good. And I don't, you know, I come and witness comes from looking at the creative and advocacy potential of many more people using video, using technology. Um, and so there's some obvious ones in our space, the ability to anonymize in a better way, the ability to dub between languages in a way that's compelling for a for an audience and doesn't look awkward, doesn't look like you're going from German to Japanese or German to English, which we all know from a Netflix video or old dub movies doesn't work. Um, and, and those are where we're seeing some commercial usages. I have to say, I do worry that um, those commercial uses are a nice addition to our creative capacity, but the malicious usages um, are extensive if we don't build the safeguards in. Uh, but our work has largely come from the malicious usage side, and I do want to recognize some of those potential good uses. Um, another question we have is, <clears throat> what is, with the evolution of tools for anyone to use them, use and create deep fakes, even on mobile with low res cameras, what is the first step that people can take to test if the video or image they are seeing is or is not a deep fake? So I guess if you can speak more on the media yeah. literacy side. There, there are no um, good technical tools publicly available to detect deep fakes now. There are a few test tools for journalists that help them detect some forms of deep fakes. Um, and there are none implemented in the platforms yet. Um, so I think what you're going to have to do is um, 
go back to some of these questions that I highlighted from the media literacy approach, like the sheep approach that first draft articulates of looking at source, um, looking at who shared it to you, how they were trying to manipulate your emotions, particularly looking at, uh, they highlight pictures and we, we highlight in the context of video. Um, I think the other thing is to recognize that many deep fakes don't need to be perfect to be dangerous and impactful. Um, so when we describe this phenomenon of misuse of, um, um, of uh, deep fakes in non-consensual images, to, those don't need to be realistic to be deeply harmful to um, individuals' dignity, to their personal safety. Um, and in that case, it's really about how do we push back against the sharing of those? Uh, what, what rules do we and what laws do we decide around that? Um, so, but at the moment, there's not an easy tool. We have to think about media literacy, but we do need to think how the platforms um, introduce better ways to give those signals to users. Great. And then I think another question is, clearly there are a lot of priorities that have come up from Witnesses' work. What, in your view, is the most critical thing for the tech platforms to do right now? Um, I think there's, I actually think it's multiple things at once. I don't think we should let them off the hook that they shouldn't do several things at once. They are multi-billion dollar companies. Um, and, uh, and I think the things they're investing in now, they should be doubling down on. Um, so they need to build detection that's accessible. They need to continue to invest significant amounts of money in building detection algorithms and then making that detection available to a wide range of stakeholders. One million is nice, but we need more than that. And we need it from multiple platforms and multiple platforms sharing information. So that's detection. They need to decide on the authenticity, how they best build a solution that serves the genuine needs of people to better track trust without excluding and further making it hard for um, a range of critical stakeholders and ordinary people globally to be less trusted rather than more trusted with these mechanisms. So they need to listen to civil society and media voices and build that responsibly. Um, and they need to keep focusing on shallow fakes. I would like to see very soon a much better way of doing a reverse video search in platforms, in WhatsApp, in Facebook. So you could quickly see that video is not Wuhan, it's Indonesia. That video is not someone suppressing a protest in yesterday. It is someone suppressing a protest two years ago in a different place. Those kinds of things would be critically useful. Great. Uh, somebody in the chat, uh, you know, we, we know that we've worked in areas like Myanmar before, and somebody has asked if you have any recommendations for the Myanmar election or other places that have low media literacy. I think this is super important and um, I was very happy we had a chance to be at the Myanmar Digital Rights Forum, which is an incredible meeting of digital rights activists in Myanmar uh, last month and we talked about deepfakes and we got feedback from uh, people there and we've heard it also from other countries in the region like Cambodia and Indonesia. Um, we have a tough challenge here. I don't, I don't think it's a high chance that deepfakes will be used in the upcoming Myanmar elections. And again, I always want to decenter us worrying about them being right ahead of us and panicking right there. Um, so I would encourage a much stronger focus on shallow fake media literacy. So very simple principles adapted to help people understand one, two, three, four around this. The other thing we're actually focused on is I've just used two jargon words right there, shallow fakes and deep fakes. And then earlier I said miscontextualized video. What on earth do those mean to most people? And is it a good distinction? We really need to think about how we use language that helps people um, understand a problem at a very simple level, understand when a distinction is important. So it's important to understand a deep fake um, if you're trying to give people a technical signal and say, this is a way of manipulating things that you may not see to the human eye, so you need this technical signal, uh, but it may not be important to explain it in other terms and other ways. So um, I would focus deeply on that. Um, if you're interested in engaging with us on that, please reach out. We're definitely very interested. In it. It's something we want to push funders and the platforms to really invest in is media literacy across this spectrum, uh, connected to technology tools, but not explicitly centered on technology tools. Great. Um, so Deanna has written that uh, they are a student at Oxford working on a similar project and creating a business idea to combat mis and disinformation with the focus on digital literacy. Wondering if you can, um, that sounds really great. We'd love to hear more about that and get in touch. That was the ask there. And um, Claire is wondering if you can speak more about how reverse image search works and if you can point towards helpful technical documentation on that. Yeah. So reverse image search. So um, is essentially trying to match, um, it, it has to scan your existing video content, scan, sounds, yeah. understand your existing corpus of video, your existing video you have, um, in order to create a database that then allows you to do 
um, matches that are um, either exact or um, somewhat similar to exact. Um, now, there are no reverse video searches available on platforms now. It is data intensive. Um, you can do reverse uh, image search, but it's not directly available in platforms, right? If you do open source investigation, you use a reverse image searcher, uh, like in the tool InVid or in the Citizen Evidence Lab for Amnesty, um, in order to basically take keyframes of a video and put it through a reverse image search that then searches something like Google Images. Um, so with reverse video search, think of it that way, except on videos. Um, or think of it as reverse image search, but just done in a much more effective way in platform um, around, you know, there are different ways to do it. Um, and there are different ways to do it that look at, can we do this in a direct match way or in a fuzzy match way? Um, and there is some interest in trying to evolve this. And, and this is definitely something we want to see from platforms. Um, I want to just, um, um, and it doesn't necessarily rely, it's not the same as the authentication tools. So just to, to be clear, when I talked about authenticity infrastructure, that's really about tracking much more closely uh, data about images, data about edits. It is really about granular tracking of data around an image, a video, or an audio. Um, while reverse image search doesn't require that, it's looking at generally at, uh, at, the, at the image either as a, um, you know, as a, as a set of um, pixels or as a, um, or in those terms, not in terms of um, uh, metadata as we might describe it in other ways. Great, and another question we have um, is what can we do to defend ourselves from deep fakes as everyday internet users? So if you have just any other advice. And yeah, I, I, I think um, first thing you do is um, not, not think you know how to defend yourself by having a tip to hand. Um, so tips that tell you to look for no blinking, look for blurring on the head, uh, look for the teeth being wobbly. Um, they're useful, but they probably won't last. So don't fixate on that. Uh, I would focus much more on, um, you know, who's sharing this to me? Is there corroborating sources? Um, can I work out if someone's trying to manipulate my emotions? Can I helpfully challenge others who are thinking about this? And again, I would point to the more broad guidance that we provide in the groups like First Draft um, are providing around this, which really is helpful in terms of, um, you know, helping people deal with a range of mis and disinfo, because it's unlikely that in the next week you're going to see a deep fake. It's very likely you're going to say a miscontextualized video um, or a video that has in some way been edited. Great. And then I think to close us out, I just wanted to thank everybody who shared in the chat their um, concerns and their recommendations. So somebody's written a concern is the use of deep fakes to further polarize electorates, making it increasingly difficult to assemble the diverse coalitions necessary for climate action and other broad based goals. I don't know if you want to comment on that. At yeah, all. that's that's something we've heard in multiple threat sessions. When when you center this on civic movements and you look at uh, existing strategies that are used to divide and attack movement leaders and attack movement integrity. Um, you know, it's a critical part of democracy is the ability to build coalitions. And um, yes, we've heard that. Um, and we, and certainly if we look at existing strategies that have been used in organized disinformation campaigns, um, you would have seen that obviously in the work uh, around the um, Russian involvement in 2016 and then subsequent campaigns that evolved that. Great. So we have just one minute to go. So I think to, to end on a comment, somebody wrote, prior to this, I was pretty terrified about deep fix. It's reassuring to hear that there are potential solutions. So thank you so much, Sam, for your presentation. And thank you all for your comments. Um, we hope you enjoyed the presentation. And like I said, we're going to follow up shortly with Sam's slides, um, the links that we've shared in the chat here, and uh, how to find, find out more about our work. Um, as well as with the survey. If you didn't catch the link for that, we'll be sure to send it to you. Um, so thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Bye.